namaste nisha welcome welcome Thank to us in our conversations and uh, so as with everyone else um i would begin by asking you what is your earliest recollection of either the concept or the experience of non violence well hmm when we were young uh our parents actually had us watch the movie Gandhi several years in a row is kind of like in America the tradition is everyone watches the wizard of oz every year and our families uh, my family had us watch that and so i understood the concept and i understood the history um all right you know i understood the history and the story growing up in america it wasn't that present and maybe that was the one way my parents thought let's use movies and media to to connect the kids but i don't think i fully understood it until i remember in high school one of my first organizing experiences and this is um pretty funny and this might sound strange i think to certain audiences but in high school i went to a private school where we had uniforms and there was a girls uniform and a boys uniform this was in the late 80s early 90s um and I decided as a young feminist I wanted to wear the boys uniform. I didn't it didn't say in the book that it had to be one or the other, but I thought why do I have to wear skirts? I want to wear pants like um like the boys. Why not? And uh I started doing that and I got in trouble and was told I needed to wear the girls uniform. And so then being a little rebel um or probably before that I can't remember the order, I actually stopped shaving my legs. Um and said that's why I wanted to wear pants and tried to use that as an excuse. Apparently some boys were disgusted that I didn't shave my legs and uh reported me to the office and I threw a big um fit. I'm like, "Look, I told you I wanted to wear the boys uniform. It's winter. I don't want to wear skirts. Um it's my right not to shave my legs." You know, I I laid out all of the things. Like, "You can't tell me, you know, what to be." And and we had this argument and surprisingly, when I told my parents, um who of course, you know, want me to shave my legs and wax everything, like they weren't, you know, pro-feminist or anything like that, but they thought that in the winter I shouldn't have to do that. why not wear pants so they actually stood behind me and i got all of the girls at school to also stop shaving their legs in protest i just really thought it was unfair and i remember that was my first experience of organizing was just getting all the other girls to um to do this action it's it's small and it's little but it was really important to me and it somehow sticks in my brain when you ask me that question i remember that time being a little rebel feminist in high school i know from watching your ted talk that your father surviving the partition violence as an infant as a very tiny very small baby you've described how your father uh, and 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 your grandparents family was saved uh, did that story growing up with that in the background did it uh, shape your view of you know the dynamic between violence and non violence I I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that shaped it honestly and and now I want to I want to think about it. We grew up with those stories. I definitely remember being anti-war. I was in uh middle school when the first Iraq war started and I remember having this feeling of I might be a pacifist. I remember thinking that. And this was I grew up in Georgia, which is a very back then a very conservative republican state that's very pro military pro intervention certainly you know no one was going to object to any wars that the US started internationally and i remember feeling out of sorts i do remember that and thinking why are people excited about going to war now i understood that this is an a regime that we wanted in power but i really couldn't understand that sentiment that excitement about us going to war or people whose children and um were sent off as soldiers to war like i remember not wrapping my head around it and i made a music taste with a music tape with all of these like protest songs from the 60s that were very pacifist leaning and you know that some somewhat was out of sorts and i do remember having a conversation with my parents about 
that time and about Gandhi and nonviolence and what that meant for them. And their interpretation was there's a time and a place for it. And more of it is a strategy. If you have no way of winning militarily, then you need to get creative. Then you use whatever tools you have, not as a moral stance. It was definitely more of a strategic stance. And, um, you know, they liked being um, American uh, and having the strongest military in the world. So that was what I grew up with. My dad is a Republican. Um, he likes US dominance and military. And so I don't know that he connects, connects them back and forth. But I remember having that idea, like it's a strategy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, use that if you have nothing else. That's why, you know, in India, they had to use it. Um, I guess that excited me. I've always wanted to do the the strange thing. And I actually got involved in a lot of nonviolent civil disobedience work uh, later in high school and then in college. And I worked on a lot of causes and uh, I studied um, nonviolent, like all, I mean, there was no one more prolific in terms of writing than Gandhi, but start, studied a lot of other theorists in college and really felt like um, this was something me and my views could use and learn from on the left because I was on the streets and we were protesting and locking ourselves to buildings and, and uh, you know, causing a big scene outside of the White House or outside of, I was a vegetarian, I'm still a vegetarian, but we had a protest outside the circus where there was animal abuses and, and lock, locked, I locked myself in the center of a three, wing, three ring circus by the neck. And I remember when I locked myself by the neck, this was one of the first arrests, I was pretty young, and there's thousands of people coming to the circus. And I remember at that moment, once we were locked, the keys were thrown away. I wasn't going anywhere. And I turned to the six or seven people locked with me. And I thought, we're ruining these children's nights. And that for the first time was dissonance in my head that not every tactic and strategy there is, is the right thing for the right time. There hadn't been education. Those folks didn't know why we were there. There were kids who had no say that were really just coming for a night of entertainment. Their parents might not have known better. And that's when I got really, really into the idea of escalation of tactics, that you really have to start at the first part, which is a conversation, which is really understanding where each other is coming from, finding that common ground to talk about the common pain that we all share to move an issue forward and realize that some of those more, you know, escalatory tactics were for later in a campaign, mm -hmm. uh, for much later. And I actually started in college this conference, it was called the National Conference on Civil Disobedience, where I wanted to bridge academia with activism because I thought although my activism on the streets could learn a lot from history and textbooks and these theorists talking about nonviolence, I thought the same thing from academia. I had professors who had just been studying it for a long time and hadn't actually been in the streets and felt the movement in the moments and what's possible with new youth coming up. And I've been continually interested in that split mm. and um, what we can learn mm. from cross sector and other people. And I think being connected to both the sentiment in the streets and the knowledge and theory in the textbooks is critically important. Disha, is this interest which uh, took you to Burma, to Myanmar? Because I know in the late 90s you were there and uh, you were given a five-year sentence for distributing pro-democracy leaflets. You spent time in jail uh, yeah. in military Myanmar. Uh, how did that shape your present self? And uh, how long were you in jail in Myanmar? When I was arrested in Myanmar, that was certainly one of the, I mean, it's one of the most formative experiences in my life. I was, I had just finished college and was starting grad school. And the only other active, I mean, the most active group on campus um, outside of the one that I started, which was mostly around animal rights and um, nonviolent theory, the other active group was the Free Burma Coalition. And they were very active with uh, campus boycotts and divestment campaigns. And they had speakers of people who had been in exile or who had fled, who had experienced violence. And they were organizing a trip in the summer to Thailand. 
to be on the border between Thailand and Burma and learn about the experience, learn about what was happening inside the country. And it was Burma at the time. Um, so I went with the Free Burma Coalition. A bunch of us went. We talked to people in Bangkok and then on the border regions in refugee camps. We actually crossed the border and spent some time inside the rebel camps of a lot of the ethnic minorities who had fled the city and were trying to protect their own land. And I, that was huge for me, understanding the experience that people had gone through. It had been 10 years since there was a massacre in 1988, the uprising that happened on August 8th, 1988. So I was there the summer of 98. And a woman, her name is Debbie Stothard, who lives in Thailand. She runs an organization called um, ALTSEAN, and it was for countries and all of the ASEAN nations to put pressure on Myanmar for their human rights abuses. And she wanted to organize an action for that anniversary, the 10 year anniversary of the 8888 massacre. So she gathered 18 people from around the world and six of us were Americans. Three of us were from my trip. Three, ah, four of us were from my trip from American University to Thailand. And we went in to Myanmar, we handed out very small leaflets. They're the size of business cards. And they said, we are your friends from around the world. We support your hopes for human rights and democracy. That's it. But in a military dictatorship, that is highly illegal. We smuggled them in, in the soles of our shoes, in our bathroom bags, and we had a very planned action. And by this time, I had actually been studying nonviolence theory and I felt very confident in the action that had been planned. Um, all of our diplomats were on notice in case we didn't make our flight home. She had definitely brought in people from countries that had more economic influence over Myanmar at the time. US had downgraded our diplomatic relations. So it was very dependent on countries like Thailand being able to put pressure. And we didn't make our flight home. All 18 of us were arrested. I didn't know at the time. And we only spent about a week in jail. We had a sham trial. Um, we were sentenced to five years and then deported the next day. Now, of course, I didn't know any of this happening, but I knew enough, I had studied enough that fear wasn't an option in that moment, that I knew however long I was in there, I couldn't present fear, no matter what I was feeling. I really had to stay grounded in the people I had met. I needed to stay confident in who I was and that this was something worth fighting for um, and sacrificing my time and my life for. I knew the risk going in there. I look back on it now and think, oh my goodness, like that was crazy. How was I not more scared? But I, that's what I knew. That's what I had studied. That's what I've been trained to do to stay as calm as possible. And I don't think it hit me until much later. Um, when we were deported, this was very important part of who I am now. The US government didn't have the diplomatic relations. We didn't have an ambassador inside Myanmar, but the head of the Human Rights Commission in our Congress was a Congressman named Chris Smith, who's from the state of New Jersey and he's a Republican. And he flew all the way to Thailand to try to get us out. He used his power as a Republican and you know, in the US we're extremely divided um, Republicans and Democrats and me always being someone for social justice has always been far, far, far to the left. Uh, I couldn't believe it. I really couldn't believe that somebody that identified as Republican was going to come across the country because he believed in us and he wanted us out. And he also had been speaking out against the human rights abuses in Myanmar for a long time. And I shared a plane ride with him home. And I remember thinking as a young activist, am I gonna sit next to him and like question him on all the policies I disagree with? Should I talk to him about all of these things? And um, I didn't. I decided there was too much we had in common. And I spent the time talking about that, the human rights situations where we had common ground and where we disagreed, it was interesting instead of me having to fight. And I think that was the first time I realized that you don't have to fight. If there are places where you can agree, do that, work together on that. And the places where you can't, that's okay. Having that relationship means you might be able to move them in the future on that issue. You might even be able to move them right now, but building that relationship is critically important. He's still in Congress um, to this day, and that's 22 years later. And um, 
And I really appreciate that experience. I think that's given me my ability to do what I do now mm. um, for work. Amazing. Uh, Nisha, how did the years at the Ruckus Society shape you? Because I know you were with them for some time and they uh, this is, I think, after your my, Myanmar experience. Uh, because in between, of course, you did the Masters in Peace and Conflict Resolution at uh, the American University. Uh, but in what ways did the Ruckus Society's work on active nonviolent training also then shape what you do today before we come to that? Yeah, that was the obvious place for me to work. Um, after college, actually, after grad school, I worked for the War Resisters League, which is an international organization. I know they're active in India as well. And I was their national organizer in, um, at the War Resisters League, traveling around to all of our chapters, talking about active resistance to the military. And it's a very strong pacifist organization. When I left there, it was for the Ruckus Society. It was a job there, which excited me. Um, in a different way, where War Resisters League really has a lot of that theory and really connects people who have a deep belief in nonviolence and pacifism. Ruckus was about the activists, the people on the street, also committed to nonviolence, very committed in everything they do. But I saw um, the WTO protest that happened in Seattle was an active part of that and Ruckus Society formed out of that after a few actions. And so I joined them not that long after. And what Ruckus Society did was bring people to camps in the middle of the woods and train people on not just the theory and history of nonviolence, but then the actual tactics. How do you scale a building to hang a banner? What makes a good banner and a good message? If you're gonna do a sit-in what do you need to tell the press? What do the images need to look like? What do you need to think about? It was all the hands-on training that you used to get from the schools that were active in the civil rights movement, like the Highlander Center in the South. It's that kind of training that had been missing for a long time. And I loved continuing that tradition. I think it's an important tradition that if you gather together, you can learn these, these strategies that you know they're not taught anywhere else. So I loved my time at the Ruckus Society. I learned a lot. I got to climb big redwood trees that I never would have imagined that I would have done and meet people who are still really closely connected right now in life. And I actually see a lot of people from the ruckus days in very powerful positions in the social justice movements, on the left, in government, because that training was really critical to our development and our growth. So, yeah. yeah. Be before we, one last yeah. dimension, before we get into the details of uh, Dream Core, that in this last 20 years, uh, uh, while there has been all this work at the grassroots in America on nonviolence, uh, we also all know that polarization has reached an unprecedented proportion and, and the kind of uh, spilling over of um, prejudice and, and racism has shocked, I think, even people who thought they knew American society. How have you dealt with that? Emotionally, how have you dealt with that? It's hard. It's really hard. And you said divided. And I think that divided is right. That you can live your entire life in one side of that division. And so you don't hear the other side. You don't see the other side. You know it kind of exists, but it feels very far off and vice versa. And so I'm raising my kids here in Berkeley, California. It would take a long drive before they even encounter a Republican. Um, racism is something that is still in Berkeley completely uh, unacceptable. Whether or not people have you know, racist tendencies, of course that's here, but any type of sexism or racism or hatred based on uh, gender identity or sexuality, that is legislated out in Berkeley. So my kids get to grow up. My son, um, he's not just the only Nikhil at his school, which I didn't grow up with any Indians at my school in Georgia. Um, one of his friends since kindergarten has been uh, on his baseball team, soccer team in all of his classes. There were three Nikhil's at his elementary school and he's not the only half Indian, half Jewish Nikhil at his school. <laughs> like this is a very different place than where I grew up with where I grew up in Georgia. And that is part of it, our location and our distance. I think the media and social media has made that distance uh, 
has made it hard to bridge that distance that I could be the most educated person reading good news sources all day. And my father in Atlanta is doing the same thing. And we have a completely different view of the world, completely different picture of the world, completely different stories we're reading. We're not even living on the same planet anymore. So being able to communicate across that divide is really hard. So on the one sense, how does it make me feel? I feel pretty safe here. I feel uh, great to, it's easy for me to talk to my kids. How I feel about our country and our future is scared and devastated. I think that we, the election right now to, uh, for Biden to win is very important. It means we don't have to fight the authoritarianism in the, in the very obvious hatred coming out of the White House, which sets the tone for the country. But now we're gonna have to fight to bring ourselves back together and that is something we haven't done. And no one, there's no country in history that's had to bridge this media divide before. That's new. And we're gonna all have to learn together what that looks like because I don't think it's the same fighting posture and resistance posture that we had over the last four years. I do think it's time for common ground. I think it's time to reach across the aisle, not so we can you know, come up with a moderate solution, but reach across the aisle to the other people suffering who have different views than us. We're suffering from the same things, from a bad economy, from this divide and conquer and pitting each other against each other. We're all suffering from that, but we can't seem to bridge that divide. And so I think that's necessary. It's a turn, it's a turn towards more human conversations than just resistance of the authoritarianism and racism of the last few years. I think it brings back the importance of that experience uh, when you flew all the way back from Thailand, uh, you know, with the Republican congressman and how you discovered your common ground. Uh, so, Nisha, now uh, can you describe how the idea of Dream Corps came to you and when did you found it? So, Dream Corps actually was founded by Van Jones. Van Jones okay. is a yeah, he's a he was an activist like me as well. I actually met him on the streets when I worked at the Ruckus Society. He was trying to shut down a youth prison in California. He was very active uh, in fighting against police brutality. And we were very similar upbringing in terms of our activism and on the streets. He's also grew up in the South. And I when my kids were young, I took time off and I had to think about what I wanted to do when I got back into the workforce when they got older. And I saw what Van had done since I had seen him on the streets. He worked in the Obama White House. He started working at CNN, um, where he still works today. And he founded a lot of organizations that had national impact. And I thought instead of the local work that I had been doing for a long time, I wanted to play a bigger game. I wanted to make change at a bigger scale. And he looked like a role model to me. And at that point, he had an organization called Rebuild the Dream which became Dream Corps. And I started working there. Uh, I've been a fundraiser for a long time, so it was easy for me to get a job fundraising. And he, his vision, um, I think he's always been a little bit ahead of the curve. He has this uncanny ability to predict where things are headed and find organizations that do that. And when I started working for him, I remember in our interview, he told me that he was gonna pass bipartisan criminal justice reform and that sounded like an oxymoron to me because I had been fighting for criminal justice reform my entire adult life and I had never seen bipartisan work on it. But he walked me through the argument and he showed me where there was common ground that we might come to it from an angle of justice where we think there's racism and it's an unjust system. But he said that there were other people on the other side who had different reasons. Fiscal conservatives think it's a bloated system that we spend too much money on. Libertarian conservatives um, don't like the police state, don't like having more policing over things like marijuana and, and drug laws and that. And the religious right believes in second chances and redemption and their anti-death penalty. And he said, these are three parts of the conservative movement that have a lot of similarities to us. Let's figure out how to make that work. And we did, and we passed a historic piece of legislation, the First Step Act, it was the largest criminal justice reform legislation in generation with that idea in mind. So when, when I started was this, Nisha? When was this passed? Two years ago, this month. And we've seen an 18% decrease in the federal prison population 
since uh, when I started and now, and that's huge. That's huge. 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 We haven't yeah. seen, we've been in a tough on crime, incarcerate everyone you can for a long time. And now we're seeing that decarceration because of that, that ability to work across the aisle, find common ground and really keep the people in mind who need it most. The people who are locked away on these long sentences for no reason, how do we bring them home? And he's like, if you keep that in mind, that's what he told me. If you keep that one thing in mind, these people should be home. Everything else falls away and we'll win. And that ability to predict the future has, I've been very excited to work for him for the last seven plus years. So I served as his chief of staff for a while and we became Dream Corps. Um, Dream Corps houses Green for All, which, these, which is an initiative to get more people of color um, into the green economic future, but also to solve climate problems by thinking about the people impacted most. And he founded that before he went to work at the White House. And uh, Dream Corps Tech, which was an initiative he founded with the rock star Prince, um, after he saw one of our violent police shootings, which was a young kid named Trayvon Martin in Florida, when the sentencing verdict came out and the person that shot him was free, Prince turned to Van and he said, how come it is when you see a black kid in a hoodie, Trayvon Martin wearing you know, a sweatshirt hoodie, you think thug and you can shoot him, but you see a white kid in a hoodie and you think Mark Zuckerberg or a Silicon Valley billionaire, which is the uniform out where I live, the white guys wear hoodies. And Van said, well, you know, that's racism, Prince. And uh, Prince said, maybe, but maybe we're not doing enough to produce more black Mark Zuckerbergs. And he gave Van that charge. He said, Van, change that. And Van, you know, um, he knows when to take orders and Prince is definitely someone you take orders from. And we founded that movement, Yes We Code, um, which today works with giant corporations training and getting more kids of color into tech fields and into great jobs. And Cut 50, which is our criminal justice initiative, which passed the First Step Act and lots of legislation throughout the country to reform the criminal justice movement. So I came to work at Dream Corps because I wanted to play a bigger game because I really believed in Van's vision and Van's work. And two years ago, when I stepped into the role of CEO, I was terrified, you know, it's a new thing for me. I liked being behind the scenes. I liked being, you know, the trainer. The, you know, I was happy to be Van's chief of staff. And that's when he told me, um, that's when you know you need to change. If you're comfortable, if you like it, if you feel pretty good at it, you're probably in the wrong place. You're not growing enough. So I accepted that challenge. Um, that if you're doing the same thing year after year, you're not growing. And I accepted the challenge. I took over as CEO about two years ago. Nothing could have prepared any of us for the year we just had in 2020, but um, we're definitely stronger through it. And we're still working on some amazing projects. Yeah. No, I have found uh, Nisha that one of the biggest obstacles to finding common ground is that uh, everybody at somewhere at the back of their mind generally uh, tends to feel that if I listen too closely or if I concede that the other person may have something, somebody who seems so opposite to me has something worthwhile to think about or to say, then I may undermine my own position, right? So in your work, how do you get past that? How do you create spaces where people can actually engage in deep listening to what is hurting the other person and making them do what they do or say what they say? That's the challenge. I think that you've hit it right on the head. That's where it all comes from. It has to be from your own personal ability to put yourself aside, your ego aside, your need to be right. So many of us are so concerned about looking bad or being wrong that that's the only thing in our way. And so that's the work. If you can put that aside and just listen, you will always get farther than if your ego is, is leading. Absolutely. And I, we say this phrase a lot at our office, common pain should lead to common purpose. 
because underneath, like you just said, underneath the complaint, uh, I don't, you said it really well, is the concern or yeah. how, that's how right. did you say? Yeah, yeah. Behind, listen for the concern behind the complaint. And that's what we say. It's the pain. Where is the pain? Yeah. Because there's something very unifying in all of our pain. We all know what it feels like to lose somebody or to be heartbroken or to have to struggle to make ends meet. That's pain that's extremely relatable. And we might go about solving it in very different ways. But that, but if you have that common pain, you can find a common purpose, which is to solve that, to make sure we're not hurting anymore. And if you have that common purpose that I want to stop that pain for you, um, you can have a common, you can have common projects. So we say that a lot at our office. When we talk about bridge building, we're like, find the common pain. And I also think something I said earlier is what helps me have those conversations is to focus on who I'm serving, first of all. So if it is for the prison issue, the folks inside, that I have to think about what their needs are, what they want, that deep empathy you have. Or when I was in Myanmar, for the folks who had not seen their families in 10 years and had no hopes of going back, the people most in need of their center. And then you think that my job isn't to win this argument. My job is to win this person into this common fight then you're also focused on the other person. So on the one hand, you're focused on the, on, the, on the people that are most affected by this. And on the other hand, you're focused at the person you're speaking to. Then the thing that goes away is yourself. You're able to just lose that ego and that personality that is you. And so that's what I try to do is really bring those two things. I actually visualize them out in front of me when I'm speaking to someone who I know that I'm likely, I was a debate team nerd. I was captain of the debate team. I, that was my path in high school. So I love to win arguments. It's not that I don't like to win arguments, but I know if I don't do this, I'll switch into debate mode. I'll just want to win and we'll fight. And I'm very persuasive. So I have to keep it almost right where I can see it. So I don't do that. So I don't get into that ego and needing to be right and yeah. uh, you know, avoid looking bad. Yeah. But you know, Nisha, there's a challenge that we all face on this. Huh? I think we must put that on the table also that what do you do when you're faced with someone who's saying to you bluntly that white people are superior? And no science, biology, morality, ethics, many ways in which you, um, you know, uh, approach it. Um, or for example, today in many parts of the world, I can tell you in India, you will find people, many people who will say this to you, that if somebody is Muslim, they must be violent. And no amount of reasoning, no amount of information uh, seems to move them from that prejudice. Yeah. So how do, you, how do you deal with that? You know, I think that there certainly is a moral call to stay present and deal with it. Certainly morally, we have to be able to have those conversations. Um, there are such things as former racists. There are such things as former KKK members, ex-Nazis, uh, right? Those exist. And in order for those to exist, somebody had to reach them. At some point, something changed. And I think that the change is not, people describe it as a spark. This happened and it changed. I don't usually think that's it. There's usually a lot of conversations that happened before that they might've ignored forever, but they live somewhere in the subconscious. And when there's one moment when something else happens and they can change. And I have to believe that because I'd rather somebody change their position from being extremely racist or a white nationalist. I have to believe it's possible. We've seen it happen. We know it can happen. Um, is it my personal job to have those hard conversations? That's a choice each person has to make. I think we have a moral obligation, but I don't think you have to subject yourself to it all the time. Yeah. What I do think is we have to use our privilege to have those conversations. So for me, that would be in the Indian community where there is a huge, um, here in the States too, a lot of anti-Muslim sentiment here I have to use my power to have that conversation there. Um, I can't walk away from it because a Muslim, you know, one of my Muslim 
friends, organizers, something, they can't have the same conversation in the same way that I can. And I have to protect them by doing it. So one, I think if you can have that moral feeling that I have to do this to protect other people, you can keep having that conversation. And sometimes you can't. And I just say, well, I see it differently and let that be it and walk away. You don't have to engage and you certainly don't have to engage online because that can be a mess. <laughs> but sometimes I just say, oh, I see it differently and walk away. But if I can stay in the conversation, then I have to show my pain. I have to show my vulnerability. I have to connect my humanity where it hurts me with what's hurting them. And I can't say it enough, hurt people hurt people. So I know, although our pain is not equal, I know that that white supremacist has something painful in their past. Something has hurt them to be able to hurt us. I know it. It might not be extreme. It's not an excuse. It's just a discovery. And I think if we can hang in the conversations and discover that, you can move all sorts of things. Restorative justice is what you're doing. And is this an idea that you feel the time, is that an idea of whose time has come? Because, of course, the idea is not new. Right. I think it is ancient. We know it from the Buddha. We know it from the works of King Ashoka. We know it from Christ. So many traditions. Mm -hmm. But in work like yours makes me feel that maybe the time has come for it to be the, the ruling idea. So can you... Say how you I think so. You. And, if, and if anyone is hanging in with me and still listening to the conversation, when I tell you that Van Jones has predictive capabilities about where the world is headed, I will tell you this. He said to me a few months ago, next year, 2021, should be all about restorative justice in terms of our criminal justice work. Um, and he said that he's like, that's the framework we really need to push. It's time has come. So he agrees with you wholeheartedly. He absolutely agrees with it. And I want to, um, on our website, on the dreamcore.org, if you search the Redemption Project, you will find eight episodes of the most brilliant TV. I've, I, I'm lucky that I got to be a part of it. It's called the Redemption Project with Van Jones. You can only see it on the Dreamcore now. It first aired on CNN, but now it's only available on our website. And it's eight episodes of the restorative justice process here in the U.S., and it is with people who survived the most violent of circumstances, come face to face with the person who did the offending for the first time. And the conversations will blow you away. The amount of healing on both sides, that restorative healing that happens is unbelievable. And if in those circumstances, they can find it. And I, I'm telling you, I was part of finding these conversations and having them. These are just regular people who went through some restorative justice work, either inside the prison or outside. Regular folks who've had the worst thing ever happen to them, either the worst mistake of their life or the worst um, crime happen, uh, loss of their kids, their mother, um, somebody even left for dead, they almost died from it. If they can heal, we can, all of us can. And that's what I come away from it is that all that it is, is that ability to open yourself up to healing and want it. No other incentive, but I wanna heal and amazing things can happen. So yeah, I do agree. You're right on. I think it's a time for restorative justice. How we move it sector to sector is, going to be interesting and how we do it in ourselves is really the real challenge yeah actually i wanted to close with that nisha that uh since the billions of young people who you know across the world who are unlikely to meet you personally or be part of your program directly what would you say to them what are some of the things that anybody can do but particularly young people in their pretty much in their everyday life, you know, which would cultivate, which would nurture these energies which you've spoken about for them? That's a great, yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
you know, I have teenagers. And so, you know, um, sometimes I can definitely give the advice better than I think, you know, my children will take it. I think the most important thing to me is to care that what I tell my own children is that our value as a family is that we take care of each other and we take care of our community and we take care of the most vulnerable people in our communities. And if we can't see how interconnected we are with their safety, um, we're lost. That's our value system. So for me, it's really just that empathy and caring is what young children need. And then they have to show some demonstrated empathy too. Um, so as parents, you know, having your kids just see that pain and volunteer and try to help is really important. Um, I think we are moving away from the individual rights framework of needing to fight just for individual rights to needing to fight for our community rights for the entire population to get better as a whole and not just one segment of the population or another segment that creates the divides. I think for kids that might be listening, it's to, you have every possible tool at your fingertips. The amount of power kids today have on the internet to learn, to experience, to actually, they can understand, like they can experience empathy just with a click on their screen. And so exploring that part of the internet, learning about other cultures, other people, other ways of being, I think is the best thing that they can do. And I definitely worry that my kids will put me through what I put my parents through. And um, I can't imagine the first call when they're in jail, but I have told them many times, if they're in jail for protesting, it's gonna be fine, nothing else. <laughs> But, you know, so. Thank you so much, Nisha. Thank you. You are all the best. All the best. And namaste. namaste. And more power to you. Thank you for having me.